you ready for the truth? Give me the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, so help me! You will never win, never again, my people ready for anything! No more secrets, no more lies, open your eyes, can you hear me? Ended up going full time out of high school. Ended up working at Columbia Fire Department. Loved the job. The best place to work. It's just a fun job. I like to know people. A lot of things going on. Um, it was a fun job, but you see a lot of bad stuff. But you know, push the back and forth sometimes. Um, overall, throughout my career, I really enjoyed it. Um, I had some to pretty devastating physical injuries and also uh, a PTSD situation that escalated and escalated over the years and ended up, um, you know, really just kind of hurt me the way the city did when I reached out for help for people in the middle of time and I was kind of I know I'm not the only person that's just been through this and I put the school to bring other people out, um, especially for the people that we don't I mean, so when you started out, I mean, you were doing pretty good for maybe, what would you say, for a couple of years? Oh man, for, for a long time, well, looking back, that's like 2020, knowing what I know about PTSD now, I can see as it progressed throughout my career, and I looked at these students for help for, I guess, the Alamo Rescue One. I guess maybe back in 2014, 15, okay. maybe somewhere around there, um, with the first trauma resources. And I believe it's Dr. Lynn, I believe that was like, I'm not exactly sure on where we but um, I was letting know I was having some bad dreams and some, some kind of some you know, thoughts when I was awake about some calls of wrong children from the past. And I, I was going there and, and letting them know I was having a lot of regression issues, like just out of nowhere. Um, little things are really triggering into depression, and that was concerning for me because I'm usually a very nice, calm person. And you know, I was getting concerned as to what was going on. My wife has got kids who have been to war and came back with PTSD. She said, I think you have PTSD. I'm like, let me get that checked out. I was like, oh, whatever. And, you know, I went to the first trauma resource to get that checked out. And Dr. Lynn told me that he said, quote, unfortunately, your city, nor your department, will allow us to diagnose any more of y'all with PTSD because they're scared they're all going to retire. They said it could make you retire? They said that they weren't allowed, that they said the city and the department wouldn't have allowed them to diagnose anybody because of PTSD because they, they, they were scared everybody was going to claim PTSD and retire. So did they offer you any other, anything else to, the, to supplement that or I mean, they just sent you on your way? Or? They gave me a shift off and said, there you go. They just gave you one shift off. So shift might, have been, two, might have been two shifts. One or two shifts. And then shift off. So it's just like 24 hours, right? So you yeah. had like 48 hours to, to deal with this, to get yourself better, and then go right back out there onto the job. So after you, know, you, you got those shifts off, I mean, did you get any pamphlets or anything? Anything that teaches you, or that told you how to cope? They, they, they give you anything? You know, anybody from the department tell you, hey, you know, meditation or you know, do this, sleep, exercise? They, they, no, they moved me off the rescue one, like two shifts, two shifts later. That, and that was it. And so, and how, how did you cope overall? I didn't think I had PTSD. You didn't think it had. I mean, you probably didn't recognize it, right? Because there wasn't any clear definition of, hey, this is probably what that. You no, know, they had just had two firefighters or two people. Fire department retired from PTSD. I mean, they had PTSD, they had legitimate uh, fighting, you know, and then they got scared. And I think that's what triggered them to say, We will not diagnose anybody with PTSD. People yeah. work with PTSD. Yeah. It's been that. So essentially, what it sounds like is you, you had an open wound that you wanted healed, but they weren't offering you any way to patch it. You were just for the most part, plugging the hole. Oh yeah, I'm still plugging the hole. Still plugging that hole. Years later.
So you're dealing with the, you know, the mental issues, and you're figuring out a way to get by, and you're trying to plug that hole. Uh, how did you fare up physically? Um, physically, it was devastating my body. My performance was anybody that's in the mood. It's, it's a rough job. It's a fun job, but you don't realize that you get older how bad your body is taking a toll. Earlier on in my career, in 2006, I think it was October 2nd, 2006, the house fire and sheetrock um, stuff that got wet, it collapsed down on top of us. And it hit me just right, ended up um, damaging my neck. Um, pretty much almost broke my neck to where um, I had to have a metal plate um, holding my C5, C6, C7 vertebrae together. So that was the most devastating injury up to that point. Uh, you know, you have back injuries, knee injuries, half the time we don't report them because we don't like going through the work trying to process it. We know how bad of an asshole it is. So we just work through it a lot of times. So, you know, you go through more knee injuries, back injuries, ankle injuries, whatever. Well, um, I think it was March 22nd, 2016, we were in a house fight on the back of Van Boken Road and the same situation that we did to. Dozens and dozens and dozens of house fires, you know, every year we do these two lot house fires. This one hit the same way, and the sheet rock hit the same way it did back in 2006. And I went back again to where I had to go out and have surgery again. And I tried to come back to work you know, after the surgery. I had another uh, place in my neck that was still damaged. It's like a metal bracket put in your neck, right? A metal plate. How long were you out of work for that? I'm out of work, I believe, nine to eleven months. First time, and I was about about eight or nine months, ten months altogether. In Columbia, uh, workers' comp agency had cleared you to go back to work after everything was done. Mm -hmm. You had physical therapy and all that stuff. No, didn't. You didn't have physical. She just had the surgery, and then just sent you back to work, right. full, full duty. Right. Uh, do you have trouble sleeping uh, and stuff like that afterwards? With the, I mean, you have. To, Pain in your neck and all that stuff. Um, I have pain in my neck every single day. How about when you like when you put on the helmet and wore the gear after uh, that? That's where I tried to go back. That's where I couldn't do it. Um, I tried real hard. I really wanted to get back in the corner. I just couldn't pull the gear, and press it down here. And, you know, you got your helmet up here, you got your gear pulling it down right here, and get it back just as fast as I could. So this was the first time. This is the first time you hurt your neck. No, that was the second. That was the second time. Yeah, that, that, this is the second time where it. It hurt throughout yeah. my career the first time. It did hurt, but the second time, it was just, I tried to come back. I, I couldn't do it. I tried to over and over. So the original time you had surgery was in 2006. That's when you had the, the bracket put in, right? I think the actual surgery was, yeah, it was like 2006. When was the second injury? Uh, March 22nd, 22. You hurt your neck a second time, uh, and you they you go back to the doctor, so they should be familiar with your injury. Or did you see a different doctor? I saw the same doctor. You saw the same doctor. What kind of treatment did you get after that? Um, it the way workers comp treats the whatever we're looking for, it's very disheartening to get treated like that. Um, they throw you off. When I was special on workers' comp, they didn't uh, send me my first payment. Now, we had just built a house, you know, got the house built. Our first payment was late, so workers' comp refused to pay. The woman who, who who likes to run the show and likes to dictate what the doctors say, um, she's very pushy and aggressive. Um, she's not a pleasant person to be around uh, because if it doesn't go her way, she will manipulate the conversation to make it go her way. Uh, her name's Alita Moore. Uh, she's a caseworker. She doesn't work for a workers' comp. She's contracted out to work for workers' comp. So she still works for workers' comp. She's, uh, uh, she would go into my daughter's appointments and dictate what the doctor would say. And finally, I told him I didn't want her in there because she was making me uncomfortable because I couldn't get much of a word in. So the doctor's, the doctor's saying you, can't, you, you shouldn't go back to work because of the injury. He did tell me at one time you might want to think about finding a new career and retiring from the fire department. And he told me that one time. And I'm devastated. So the doctor's saying this, and yeah. the work Alita Moore shows up. Now, what, what is she telling the doctor to, to sway him? What, what is she saying specifically? 
uh, about getting you back to work. Yeah, they they were like, well, can't you still work with the hell? I'm like, no. Like, can't you? I said, even the fire chief has to wear a helmet. That's not something we can do. You know, to be a firefighter, to be able to wear it every day. Put my gear. <laughs> Works fine for you. know, but she's pretty out of touch. Yeah, she's nice yeah. She's yeah, because those helmets are pretty heavy. I mean, yeah, I can see them right. in the background, and they're, you know, that's they're pretty, they're pretty burnt up and everything. You're, you know, doing some pretty serious work. Uh, and it, with the injuries that I'm looking at, you know, I'm no doctor, but it looks like that's a lot to put on your head. And then you're saying like sheetrock, you know, a lot of people don't know how heavy sheetrock is. And on top of when it gets wet, it's even more heavy, and that's a lot of weight falling on your head. And Miss Alita Moore is, is telling the doctor to write you a note to not wear a helmet and then send you back to full firefight duty. So that you would run into fire just with no helmet on. Yeah, she, she didn't really know what she was talking about. She was just there to get workers' comp. She's taking the lowest in camp. She's trying to find new people with new manipulated techniques to get. She has a checklist that she has to write down. She has to make a list for And I don't remember exactly what she was saying because I don't want to quote her because I don't remember. But she was kind of all over the place. If the doctor would say something, she would kind of cut him off. And then, you know, well, he might could do this. Well, what about this? What about this? And he, she just kept cutting him off, and he, he couldn't get a word in. So she would dictate that conversation. She would, she would make that conversation. And then him saying, okay, well, he can go back to work. He, he's able to go back to work. You know, the doctor, I don't know, he never really gave me an honest opinion after he said, you know, you may have to not, or you may have to retire from the fire department. He told me that one time. And she said, well, can you do this? Can you do that? I said, I can try, you know, but she, I don't know what she wanted me to do. I have no clue because the doctor gave, or really gave me a, a disability rating of 20 something percent for this injury. Well, then she got a hold of him with workers' comp, and the workers' comp got him for somehow or some reason to lower it down to like a three. And then my lawyer started fighting for me with workers' comp. It became a, you know, a, just a peeing contest. And got it up to like, I don't know, maybe 12, but I don't, I don't know why it jumped so far without, that That was workers' comp's influence mm -hmm. and the, the nurse case manager's influence on that doctor. And that doctor should have had more backbone to stand up. I mean, everybody that I've known that's gone through workers' comp battle has been treated horribly. And I hope more people come out about it too. I really do. I guess, you know, one of the big questions people are going to ask is, uh, you know, was this documented properly when you first heard, when you were first heard, you know, with proper avenues taken, I mean, did you notify the right people? Or did you fill out the right documentation to make sure that you were, you know, did you do everything on your end that you were supposed to do to make sure that you were taken care of? To my knowledge, everything that I did was, that I could do was done. Um, but just to show how bad workers' cop is, I had two administration chiefs say I had to get the body. Did you, they, they told you that you should get a lawyer. Two chiefs. Yeah. The administration uh, division, not stretch division, like above division. Uh, two chiefs or something. I think you get a lawyer. And this is after your second injury? After Correct. Your second injury. They told me that on the first injury, too. So you did get a lawyer? Did you, did you or did I you? Had to, you had, had to get a lawyer? Of the lawyers that they were facing the Philippines. And what was the result of that? Uh, a bunch of pissing contests with workers' comp. How long did it take? My, my lawyer that I had used to work with the workers' comp. He said they are using a technique that's called starting the without notice to start up. What they do is they hold you over and over and over, give you the least the minimum they can for as long as they can, so your finances get so crappy that you have to take whatever settlement they give you. They started me out. They waited for, for a year and a half, almost, I guess between a year and a half and two years, to give me a, a mediation. And that mediation after that, all they offered me was nine thousand dollars in the beginning. Nine thousand dollars. That was their initial offer to what we we, we offered them. Their counter was nine thousand dollars. But eighteen years later, I mean, here you are. I mean, you you, you served faithfully. Yep. I mean, you were dedicated community, and that's all they offered you was nine thousand dollars. You know, you were a captain. You, know, you progressed in rank, uh, which is not an easy feat. Uh, and after a year of them starving you out. All you were offered by the city of Columbia was nine thousand dollars. That was their initial offer. I, was, I remember just being like, you know, I, I gave, I literally broke my neck twice for this department to make all these people in these upper positions look really good with the news. You know, we all did that. You know, they're going to offer me nine thousand dollars for the get-go. You couldn't get. You never got back to work. Uh, you were never able to get I back. I never got back. 
you had to you had to retire. So what? And then so what came came of that afterwards? Did get near what we should have. Um, I wanted to go to court because I believe we would gotten everything that we asked for in court, uh, and I couldn't because it started out, and I had to take what they gave me at that mediation. So you, you see, took, I mean, you took the money because at this point, like you said, they were starving you out. You needed it. You've got a wife. We had to. We didn't have chance. You got, you got a wife. You got kids. You got. Yeah. You, got a, you, you got to keep the lights on. Keep food on the table. Yeah. So uh, at this point now, you're you're retired. The fire department. And are, you, are you getting retirement pay? Yeah. Okay, so you're, are you already getting retirement pay? Yes. So I mean, this is kind of. I mean, you weren't. I mean, you weren't ready to leave. This is kind of like something that happened suddenly. Right. Uh, you know, it's a life changing event that a lot of people just aren't ready for. You you think you're gonna go on forever. You think you're gonna go on to a certain date and time, but this kind of it just threw a wrench in your system. So, I, I, so after you retired, what did you do after that? How did you cope? Like, how did you guys get by? Um, I didn't cope well with retirement. Um, my mind was, well, it was, it was like it was throughout the years. It was just getting more and more clouded with all the bad stuff. It didn't change much of the kids were positive. I with you, more positive. Those are my main problems. But my head was getting so clouded with all these thoughts and all these dreams. I, I couldn't, I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know what the PTSD is um, I went to therapy, um, tried that again. I, I was, well, this was after, I didn't go to therapy after this. I was, I stayed in pajamas and slept for about 14, 16 hours a day for nine months. I would just lay in the bed, I'd come out here, I had the trash bags on the windows, take them out, so it was dark. All I did, I just slept for like nine months, just trying to figure out what was going on. A lot of praying, I didn't know. And, um, eventually, about nine months after this, you know, my wife and I decided it was best for me to go to therapy. We tried, and about the second visit in, the therapist, he's not even a trauma therapist, specialist. He, he, was, he was like, let me ask you some different questions. How many of you have asked He was asking and asking and asking, like, this is going on. I'm just diagnosing you right now with PTSD. This is very different. You definitely have. And I was like, okay, you know, finally I have something to look with. Well, things were still escalating, you know. I didn't know what to do. You know, I'd go to therapy once a week or whatever. But some days I couldn't make therapy because I just couldn't get out of therapy. And uh, it came down to, I mean, things got really serious, really, really serious. And I ended up uh, asking my wife or telling my wife that I, I need some help. And stuff. I think I need to get somewhere. Had something to do with that. So 
so they, so these these people didn't, didn't reach out to you. I mean, they, they they didn't reach out to see if you were okay. They're not check on your family or anything like that. Sir, so 18 years of service. I mean, you, you've served and done what they told you to do and had gone work when they needed you to work, and they didn't reach out to you at all. I had a couple of chiefs that were not administrative chiefs. The, on the lower level. On the lower level, yeah. except for nobody in the administration. The only time I got a call was from Chief Jamie Helms, and that's after I had a lawyer. He was trying to smooth things out between me and workers' comp, me and workers' comp side. And he wasn't supposed to call me because I had a lawyer anyways. So I, mean, I cut that conversation short. I told the lawyer, I said, yeah, they're calling Since you've been gone, has anybody like checked on you or anything like that? Um, no, not from the administration. They just they knew that they were they knew what they were doing when they did the workers' comp thing, and they just they don't reach out to people like that. Um, now with this PTSD thing, they're gonna try to avoid me. There might even be some kind of cover up that goes down. I'm not I'm not saying it will, but it was not surprising they tried to cover some stuff up. So after 18 years of service, it's like I they forgot about you. Like you, like you didn't exist. What it, seems, this is what it sounds like. Like they don't even, like nobody even cares that you're gone, or they don't even show you any kind of appreciation. They even, they can they ever invite you back to, you know, say thank you or anything. They like never that. gave me my exit interview. Never even gave you an exit interview. Right. Since you didn't get your exit interview, if there's something you wanted to say to the Columbia administration that you didn't get to say then, and what, what would you want to say to them now? I'd like to say that I'm really disappointed in them. They came from where we were at. They had not hard to do it. They had not hard to be on the low end. They get there, do some jobs, and they get raises every year. Good about us. But I'm really disappointed that's the way they treat me. That's why they can't. I have any retention from boys now. That's how they might leave them. They call them boys. They're being treated by their city and their departments. Remember, they can't. They're not ignited. They're allowed to diagnose anybody with anything. Basically PTSD, so it's it's a it's a corrupt system. It's a very corrupt system. So I mean, do you have any advice for firefighters working there now, or firefighters, you know, future firefighters who want to work there uh, to help survive their career? Yeah, uh, take care of your mental health. Uh, your mental health is that's the biggest thing. The most important tool is your brain. If your brain is good, it's going to deteriorate. It's going to hurt. Um, it's a lot of that stuff. Uh, mental health is the most important thing. Track of and you know, watch your back with all the cities and try to tell you where to look at some point. Amongst uh, coming from the community, we thank you for your service. Uh, 18 years at the fire department, we know you probably would have done a lot more, uh, but you know, through your service, you, you suffered an injury, couldn't anymore. Uh, people like us, we wouldn't be here today if it weren't for guys like you running into those burning buildings. Uh, thank you to your family uh, for supporting you, uh, and even now. And get curious, and uh, we're sorry that that happened to you. And hopefully, this will bring more awareness and you know, bring some light to the situation. I hope the rules change.